Christ out like we got a year ago. It's kind of a prayer. So it's called Death in Summer. Every blade of grass has, a, has its angel that bends over it and whispers, grow, grow. And that's from the Talmud, which is the Jewish the commentary is on the book. Grass blowing in the wind is the breath of an angel. Each blade has its own angel, its own angle, its own anger, its own danger, its own stranger, helping it grow. So the spirit of my friend Ali now lives dormant under grass and earth. May her angel too grow her back to life in another dimension of life, another shard to reunite the world. And it's a Jewish uh, myth or story that light was all once, was one, and then it's scattered into lots of shards. And part of our mission, and maybe part of poetry and art, and the art here, is to bring this light back together. So I'm going to uh, bookmark the reading with two poems about the movies that are in, in this book. So I guess it's instead of poems about paintings, poems about movies. And the first one is called Ruby Slippers, and I know my friend Catherine, who's here, would let me read this. So The Wizard of Oz was the first movie that I ever saw like the Beatle Light. And it was the first dream I remember about the Wicked Witch of the West. So I began wondering what happened to those ruby slippers. Click your heels together three times. Repeat, there's no place like home, no place like home, no place. Dorothy wakes up in her own bed back in Kansas, and the M hovers over her, sensible as pie. The farmhands trakes in. She recognizes, or thinks she does, scarecrow, skin man, even lion, in their blunt, kind faces. Only a dream, they tell her. We dream strange things when. Presumably, life goes on after the tornado, after Oz. But whatever happens to those ruby slippers? Do they fall at her feet, slip into another dimension as she travels back to the Midwest? If not, what does Dorothy do with them? She can't wear them to milk the cows, carry slop to the pigs. They get all dirty. Besides, Auntie Anne would see. Does she hide them in the box of photographs, old jewelry, her mother's mementos, tucked in the back of the wardrobe, under the quilt? Perhaps on sleepless nights or rainy days, she takes them out, fingers their glittery surface, surprisingly warm like the skin of snakes. If Andy M ever finds them, Dorothy would say they were something made at school, props for a play about a missing princess. Stories are fine, I suppose, M says, but they don't put supper on the table. So she'd shut them away again in their narrow box. Does she ever watch a rainbow on a rainy day, or lie in the hush of sleepless summer nights and slip the treasured shoes back on her feet, remembering Glenda's magic bubble Scarecrow's brains, Tin Man's rusty heart, and even the field of poppies that made her forget, even the wicked witch of the east who wore them first, and the monkey minions of the witch of the west. Does she ever wish heart beating like hot sorry, does she ever wish heart beating like hotcakes for lion's courage to click her heels together three times and whisper, There's no place like Oz, no place like Oz, no place like Oz and wait for something impossible to happen. Thanks very much. So I think our point we're kind of going into those other worlds and coming back and going in and out and back again. Now, Skinny Dipping with the Muse started, first began as a poem, a title, so it's a title poem of the book, and that came from going to a workshop with Varna Crozier, who's a, which you all know, a wonderful Canadian poet who lives out in Victoria. But she came to a workshop in uh, Wintergreen, which is near Kingston. And it's a house sort of set in the country. It's off the grid. They use solar power. And if you walk about half a mile, you get to the lake. And this was August, and one day all the women there, including Lorna Crozier, all went skinny dipping in the lake. And how many people get to go skinny dipping with Lorna Crozier? But on the other hand, she was also our muse for the week. And I began thinking, so I wrote a poem. And I thought, well, poetry is like this. It's playful, but it's also you're vulnerable. Someone once said to me, writing is like going naked in public. You're, there's a sexuality, there's a play, you're going into the water. And another quote, comrade said that, in the destructive element, immerse yourself, and then use the power of your hands and feet to keep you up. And there's just something really intimate about skinny dipping. And if you're skinny dipping with your views or your poetry, that's really 
maybe again with another way of describing what this is all about. Skinny dipping with the muse. Make our way through twisted roots, lush leaves, along marked and unmarked trails, red and yellow arrows pointing in different directions as we walk from house to lake, which suddenly glimmers, a piece of fallen sky. Strip off our clothes, women of a certain age, hardened with stories, Splash in at once or step gingerly as cats off the rickety dock, tick tock, tick tock, time stops. Swim in this water, holding us up, taking us deep and sure away from shore, folding around us like a mother, lover, or ourselves in dream, speaking in tongues of landscape and language, naked and free. Next morning, come again alone. Waking sun stretches over the surface like a long-limbed swimmer. One bird flies through cloud and tree into middle distance. Float, butterfly, crawl into these waves. Only later spin this into words, into poetry. For now, water on skin is all I need, enough to cross the shallows, brave the depths, let me in. There's certain poems you just feel, you know, it's like about children going to one child, but certain poems are about close to your heart. So this is and then they all are in different ways. My father, who died in 1993, was a big, he was a cardiologist, and he was also a baseball fan. And we used to watch on television, and this was when the Giants were in New York. So cast your mind back, now they're playing the World Series in California. And we also had the Brooklyn Dodgers. And this was a poem that I wrote after seeing a game at what we used to be known as the Sky Dome. Father's Day 2005 at the stadium formerly known as Sky Dome. And it's a sonnet of sorts. My father never went to a baseball game, at least not when I knew him. We listened on radio, watched on TV, safe in the comfort of home, as we cheered for different home teams. New York Yankees, Brooklyn Dodgers, rarely the Giants. Only child, a girl, I didn't play, but learned all the rules. Enjoyed the slow, loping rhythms, the cool jazz of strikes, hits, balls, curving around those diamonds. You gotta have heart. We, we measured time in innings, not in hours. The long and short of it is, the last time I saw him, he counted the score on his fingers. Numbers dead on, the language was passed. Now I watch the Blue Jays at Rogers Center, nine years and more later. Look up at the dome of the sky. Hold him fast. That's for Harry. And this is on it. He would like that. And he was also a jazz fan. He loved jazz, and I learned to love jazz. And this is a little poem from my mother, who died in 2009. All that jazz, she subsides into her body like an island sinking below the surface. Below the surface of words of waking. Television plays softly, jazz between the wars. I'm just wild about Harry. My father's name, their song. Under the quilt, her toes move in time to the beat. Just that moment in time, remembered. Thank you. So, um, a little poem about childhood, and then we'll move on to some love poems. How are we doing for time? Oh. For some reason, it usually is on the camera. Okay. Uh, oh, we're completely okay. fine. Okay. Childhood then. So again, going back to childhood. We talked to childhood long ago how our mothers and fathers never hovered around the playground fence or the brow of the sledding hill, never walked or drove us to and from school, how we could play all day but never had play dates, how the streets, the woods, parks were ours until darkness called us home to supper and to bed. Surprised we survived, we say. Of course, there were incidents, accidents. Someone drowned, someone's eye put out with a pellet gun, someone. But we don't go to those shadows at the edge of the woods. It's dark there, and we're home free. section, the first section of the book, which is called Forms of Cottage, which are kinds of mourning. And now the next section is called Love Poems. So springing longing, 
Now I'm filled with such longing not to possess you or even be possessed, though desire's there, but to share time, space, touch. Our edges like fingers pressing together in that game where we shut our eyes, can't tell one finger, one person from the next, if only for a moment. And now the cardinal is singing again, and again and again, impossibly high in the treetops, as if his heart would break and overflow the world with such red music. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of time, yeah. You've got about at least another five minutes, okay. eight minutes. Okay. Five minutes, yeah. So I think this is called Swan Lake. And this is um, some romantic love. This is love for a friend of mine who was in a very bad car accident. Swan Lake for Elizabeth. In your dreams, you can walk as easy and hard as flying. You had 52 years standing on your own two feet, give or take a few those braces on your legs when you were six, and when you were an infant in arms. Until these recent seasons of forced immobility, you were, still are, a dancer, prancer, glancer, take a chancer, entrancer, romancer of people and words. Migrating water bird, trapped in too sudden ice on a murky lake, dire enchantment, not the ugly duckling waiting to transform, but free-formed swan caught in suspended flight, you will rise again from your cage of steel and wheels to music you can hear, sonorous and sweet. For we too dream of you, walking, yes, and dancing, always dancing. We see you in the islands of our minds. Imagine you flying through brilliant, white-feathered night, darkness into light, possibility into perception. Elegant as stars, space fitting into place. Liz. I'm going to read one from the book, which I usually print them because it's hard to see, but this one. This is called Bosque del Apache, and it's, um, Bosque del Apache is a nature reserve near Socorro, New Mexico, which is about an hour south of Albuquerque. And there's a very, there's swans and pelicans. I saw a huge flight of pelicans come to the water and other birds. Snow geese, pelicans, wild swans. Zeus could have taken Leah in a place like this, the morning of the world. Your beating wings take me to heart, tear me apart, put me back together, feather-like touches, tasting tears and warm plums. Late evening light reaches sage sand. Tomorrow's brush of dawn swings us into now. The light there is quite amazing. Here's sort of the other side of love. And I'll read so this one I haven't read aloud. So hopefully you'll be a good audience for this. And sort of the other, you know, love involves a lot of joy, but also some fear. This book, Fear is a Love Talk. Fears about you. Her shadow is still in our bed. Her sex, her power, her comings and goings. All in the past, you tell me, not a problem. I remember the slap of your words, even when we come back together, more than friends. You're flinching once in bed when I touch you. Only the heat, you said, the lingering flu. What will happen when we meet again? We make love, make coffee, make conversation. So what am I afraid of? Turn your fears into a love poem, one teacher said. But that's just it. I love you, write you love poems. But love's a word you will not say to me until you do. That, that was such a good poem to write. You know, sometimes there are poems you can learn a lot just by writing them. Um, this is called The Bar at the End of the Universe. And it's uh, a little more magic, a little like, more playful, less personal. New Year's Eve 2012. We were at breakfast, imagining conversations in another quantum dimension. Aquinas having a beer with Einstein and Gerdel. Tom, Al, and Kurt by the end of the evening. Theories flying wild, paradoxical, relatively free. Coleridge in discourse with Tolkien in the language of Middle Earth. Marilyn Monroe reading poetry with Sylvia Plath and Emily Dickinson, like girls at a pajama party. Richard Feynman playing drums and drawing diagrams. 
And just for argument's sake, Socrates, in dialogue with the Buddha and Genghis Khan, on the meaning of violence. Round midnight played on the jukebox with an orchestra composed entirely of strings. And the whole joint was jumping, even the giant cockroach skulking in a corner. They talked for all hours as there was no more time or space, no way to measure with certainty. Outside, we heard a soft somewhere between a bat and a river, but no one was paying any attention. Whistling windstorms in my ear. 